important social service. Uh, if you allow me, let me just mention to you, uh, during the the, uh, the genocide in, in Rwanda, uh, and one thing that happened, and it was very clear, was the cause of the, uh, the conflict was well known, it's ethnic-based, but one thing that actually everybody didn't realize was how are we actually defining uh, the people? You know, how are we defining uh, uh, the issues uh, in in that country? Uh, it became a quite of a message, and everybody uh, who had been interviewed after the genocide says it was a message we received, and the way they framed the message uh, is actually contributed to the uh, to, to the genocide. Yeah, so I want to make that. Comparison, but I want to tell you that everywhere you go around the world, and if you study history, all conflicts, all, all the, uh, the ethnic hatred, and all the things that you hear is based on someone actually framing the issue uh, uh, and, and very much using that issue to galvanize uh, the community, well, well informed or not, and using that to do a lot of same time, there are a lot of people also who actually frame the message, uh, and, you know, and and frame it in a way that also bring people together. So I am very very proud with our relationship with Welcoming America because they are actually helping us uh, how we should be framing uh, the work that we do. Yeah, some people actually these days prefer to call us actually, and some of you as contractors. You know, basically people who just get paid to do what the government tells them to do or the agencies tell them to do. I happen, I happen to disagree, uh, as, as Rachel mentioned about my past. Um, you know, this work is not about a contract. This work is not about really res somebody getting some resources. This is a work that we do collectively because it is a reflection of who we are. It's actually a reflection of our own value system, and that's why and most of you are in this work because it speaks about who you are, your commitment, your value system. So if that's the case, since we don't do it for money, because I think some of you could probably make more money uh, by working at IBM or some other place, that then you are actually doing what you love. And when you do what you love, it's no longer work. It's just called living a meaningful life. So that's what we are doing. So as a former refugee myself came to this country when I was young. I believe we all have to take into consideration how we define what we do and how do we actually uh, define the people we want to uh, work with. I remember uh, 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 something I read many, many years ago. Uh, one thing I believe is if, if you are a social worker or if you are a case worker, Worker, if you're actually managing a non-profit organization trying to help people, there's an old Chinese saying, you know, before you open a business, learn the language of the customer. And I happen to believe that if you want to do this work, you have to know the client or you have to somehow find a way to see yourself from the people you serve. So if you see yourself from the people that you are serving, then you want people to talk to you because if somebody is trying to define the client in, in a deficit based, you know, that they don't speak English, they don't have transferable skill, uh, they dress like this, and so on and so on, that, that's a very negative way of defining it. And for me, if somebody is trying to define refugees as just focusing only on the shortcomings that they have because they are a new country, then I feel that that person is really not connecting with the client. And I'm not sure that person can be a good messenger or a good advocate on behalf of the refugees. Because if I'm defining my client as, as a kind of, you know, all kind of deficit, I, is it possible for me to see myself through that? I think so. My idea of the case management, my idea of working with a client is, first thing is to see ourselves through the people we want to help. That's key in my view. So, so an effective messengers uh, and, and, and building new champions for refugees is important for the long-term success of the refugee program. 
imagine if we say to the, to the community and say, well, we are processing to bring in 5,000 refugees, uh, but most of these refugees have mental health issues, uh, they do this, uh, they have this problem. Imagine what how we define the client. We are actually so dedicated to help. You know, we already give a certain stigma. Now, I'll tell you something. Based on my own experience, if you end up a refugee, and I don't wish anybody to be a refugee, the experience is a lifelong experience. Yeah. It's always nightmares. If you survived in the 1940s in, in Europe uh, and went through uh, that horrible situation, it's this is something you would always move away with you. The refugee experience experience of people who have been tortured and abused and raped in their experience. It is already tattooed in the you know in the brain, you know, in our heart. So we all have you know, mental health issues. But not to the point that we cannot take care of ourselves also. But the proof is if a single mother who have been raped, who have been, you know, brutalized for a long period of time if she can actually keep her kids together and come to this country, you know, that person is incredibly powerful and strong. Yeah. Now, sure, that experience she went in her camp or in her journey to this country will always be with her. It doesn't stop her. If she didn't give up, yeah. If she didn't give up, then we have no choice to work with her because she is a very strong, You know, so we have to, in our in our desire to help refugees, you know, we have to we have to come up with a way that we have to frame the issue. This is refugee resettlement is a humanitarian program. It's an employment program. I understand employment is very very important. You know, it's actually part of the entire of the recovery system. If you have been abandoned, if you have been disposable for a long period of time, the first time a case manager talked to you about employment and you can make it, that's really a healing process. But at the same time, you should not measure the success of this program based on how many people got a job within 30 days or 90 days or 180 days. I understand those are necessary measurements that we have to do. But we cannot, we cannot get that this is a humanitarian program. Otherwise, we could actually bring people with PhDs, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, transferable skills who speak the five languages and bring them here. And then it becomes an employment program rather than a humanitarian program. So how we frame it? You know, it has been an issue for me, and I have been talking to a lot of people. In my that, you know, you are writing a, a proposal to help a group of refugees, you know. In my, the beginning of that proposal is says, you know, give us a need assessment. I have been to think that, you know, in that need assessment, I think we have to show for a strengths based of the client we want, you know, rather than basically saying they don't speak English, they don't have transferable skills, and so on and so on. So, you know, basically do humanize them. In fact, everything out of them, and then in a, the conclusion of that proposal becomes. Well, but if we get the resources, we can actually resurrect them. Yeah, you know. Then we can actually lift the map. You know, I just want to believe there is a different way of writing that proposal. I think we can focus, uh, as they say, uh, on the roses rather than the torn kind of things. And I happen to believe sometimes, you know, uh, it's it's some people mention to me it's my weakness that I happen to actually see the glasses half full rather than half empty. And I believe that in the social service arena, especially in refugee work, we have to, if we want to uh, be an agent of change, and, and if we want to help people, we have to first recognize these are very powerful people, these very strong people. They're, these are the dreamers. They are determined to make a difference against all odds. You know. Imagine going the journey that they went. I happen to believe uh, a, a strength-based advocacy, a strength-based 
work is what our community needs. I think when we talk about refugees in, in a way that will be lifting lifting them up uh, in a way uh, you know that that empowered them in a process we're empowering ourselves and I think the community will be there for us so I'm not sure I have more time I think it's ten minutes uh, so with that, I, I again I want to talk at, thank you uh, the welcoming America I think you are doing a great job and I want to, uh, to thank all of you who are, who are getting yourself to help refugees and welcoming uh, refugees to this country. You know, our history, the history of this country has been always history of refugees and immigrants. You know, uh, we, don't, we don't have the luxury of, uh, uh, you know, kings and queens, and, and, and our history is not based on that. This is just, in my view, in my own reading of American history, there's already people, you know, refugees and immigrants, you know, come to this country and do extraordinary things. And that great things about this country, and that's the history of this country. I think was welcoming America, and all of us will continue that tradition for a long time to come. And thank you very much for having me also. Thank you so much, Director Nagash. We really appreciate your kind words, and also really applaud the vision you shared of this whole community approach and and, uh, and, and really being able to reach that broader community by speaking to the resiliency and strengths uh, that refugees contribute uh, that we live in, and helping the body really understand why refugees are worth investing in. If they only hear about the need, they'll never be able to understand the opportunity, and it really is up to us to communicate what that opportunity is. So with that, um, I'm just excited to share with all of you on the phone that I think working together we have this really unprecedented chance before us to reshape the way that our neighbors and colleagues understand refugees and to help them rise and invest in newcomers as contributors that will help our communities reach their fullest potential. So I want to uh, begin by reviewing our goals for today's webinar. We're going to be learning about messaging frames and their importance, We're exploring uh, messages that we hope uh, will resonate with you and with your communities, inviting your ideas uh, as part of an ongoing process to shape uh, some new messages about refugees. Um, we've got a great team uh, with our communications learning circle that you may have heard about in uh, previous webinars who are going to be helping us to do that and playing a real leadership role in that process. Uh, and we're asking you to think about how to apply some of these ideas in your work. Dr. Nagash uh, said words that we use really do matter a great deal. Uh, and that's why I'm so delighted uh, to be joined today by Holly Minch and Amanda Cooper with Lightbox Collaborative. Uh, they are a close partner of Welcoming America, an arm that has helped hundreds of passionate advocates, just like I know all of you on the phone are. Uh, to tell our story in a way that will resonate with people that can most help us and those serve. As Lightbox helps do-gooders do better. I just love that. A really interactive session lined up for us and are going to be calling on you later in the webinar to share your thoughts. Ready for some learning and some fun as I turn things over now to Holly and Amanda. Thank you so much. We are really excited to be partnering in this conversation. Um, I really just want to echo and connect and, and thank Director Nagash for the incredibly powerful opening because, to me, our charge here really is to connect with the work that all of you are doing to foster um, welcoming communities, to engage your communities in conversations about um, the capabilities of newcomers in our community, the contributions that newcomers in our communities are already making. Um, and so that's just, it's really incredible to be part of this conversation and to see it already unfolding. Um, one of the reasons that Amanda and I are so delighted and the rest of our team at Lightbox Collaborative is so delighted to be able to work with Welcoming America um, is that we feel really strongly that um, this is a network of folks who are already doing what needs to be done, right, who are already telling a very positive story about the role of newcomers in our communities and about the contributions and the capabilities and the strengths 
uh, and the deep connection really to the American dream that many, many, many newcomers in our communities uh, bring and hold in the conversations about what makes our schools and our churches and our community organizations better. So we're really excited um, to, to, to be working with you and to be working this project because we feel like there are so many strengths already operating um, in the work that each and every one of you is already doing on the ground. There are already so many positive stories. Um, and all of you are doing this work because you see the power of those positive stories. So we're delighted to, to find ways we can help support that and find ways we can help you tell those stories in more powerful and more effective ways. Um, and I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Amanda Cooper, who's going to, um, I think, give us a little bit of um, context and also help us learn from a case story where um, stories have, have, have been useful in helping to change the climate. Amanda. Right. Thanks, Holly. Um, yeah, so we always find it's fun, um, you know, just as Holly said, you know, it's clear that you guys get this, it's for the director, and you, you understand um, where the needs are, but we also think it can be valuable to take a step and kind of look at this through the lens of another movement and see how reframing has worked in other people's efforts for social justice and change and to see how those lessons could apply to the work that we're doing today. And one of the stories that we wanted to look at, because it's such a dramatic story of change recently, change that has been fast um, and um, really impactful, is work on LGBT rights, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights. Um, it's a movement that has really uh, just made leaps and bounds of progress in the last 15 years. And so it, it, it just, it's obvious that, um, you know, particular rights for LGBT couples, same-sex couples, um, are inevitable. Right? That they're coming. That there's that all of the motion is in that direction, and, and uh, you know the public opinions in direction. And we talk about the fact that that's not something that just happened. That's actually part of a deliberate strategy. And the first move in strategy was reframing. You know, the truth is there's a lot of problems for LGBT people and families. There's problems with housing rights and access to housing. There's, you know, there's still many places in this country, most of this country, where it's lawful to discriminate against someone because of their sexuality on the job, in housing, and in other ways. Um, and the advocates in this movement um, chose marriage rights as the place to focus their energy for the begin, you know, for this portion of the movement. And the reason that they did that was reframed the conversation away from individuals and who they, uh, you know, interacted with, but really it made it about families. And it made it possible to start putting LGBT families the way that these photos do. Remind them that these are folks who are committed to one another, who are parenting together, who are really just like you and me in terms of their desire to have a good life for themselves and their families and are in committed and caring relationships. And so they really made a strong, you know, not just like not every straight person is partnered, not every gay person is partnered, but focusing on partnered folks and those lasting commitments, it really changed the discussion to really normalize um, the LGBT families and make it obvious to folks that these are folk, people that deserve the same rights that every family has. Um, this is really, it's worked. I mean, there's just no arguing. The shift in attitudes on this issue in the last 15 years um, has been, you know, just incredible. Um, you can just see how those lines have moved. There's very few other social issues that have, um, or any issues really, that has shown such a, a, a strong shift from opposing up there. We were, in 1996, we were at 70 percent of people opposing same-sex marriage. Um, and the opposition is under the minority, and the majority of the people uh, support same-sex marriage in the country today. And we just don't see that kind of change that often. So um, we, we, there's just no arguing that this is something that uh, has happened in time. And that not only is this an important progress for other families and communities, but that actually makes other things possible. Um, Behind that article there is a hashtag called More Than Marriage, which is something launched by our um, Client Gender Law Center. And it's really focused on ENDA, which is the um, Non-Discrimination Act in Congress that is trying to um, make it possible for people to, or impossible 
for people to hire or fire based on sexuality or gender um, presence. It's, uh, it's called ENDA, and it's happening now. And the, the shift in the Republican support for this bill has been phenomenal. Without much work, without much effort um, on this particular bill, I mean, I, the people who are very interested in this bill will probably say that differently, but 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 just the that this is uh, there's a wave that's being ridden um and that and the support for um uh, equality has been possible to have this conversation now in a way that makes it much more fruitful than it would have been uh, 15 years ago before we had made so much progress on that issue thank you so much for Rachel for um checking out that folks can use the uh, chat bar for questions please do there's a lot of people on the call and we're trying to get through a lot of information but we do want to make sure that uh, we're being clear and understood, and so I do hope that um, if you have any questions or comments while we're talking, um, ask them at us in that window. Um, and also, there are going to be some times where we're actually asking for very specific input, and I want to encourage folks to use the chat window for that as well. Um, any questions about this at, point, at, at this point? Um, you know, the takeaway here is understanding that by reframing the fight for LGBT rights around focused on marriage, focused on caring and committed couples, um, we shifted attitudes there, and that attitude shift on that one issue, and that reframing the conversation to be around those cults and their and their stories, um, has made other things possible now in a much shorter time than people had anticipated. Can you add on that before I no, move I on? I think that's exactly right. It's just a, a great. Um a great way to underscore the power of story to really shift a conversation to open space for more and more possibility. So now let's get back to talking about refugees. And I'd love to play the word association game with folks for a second. Um, use your chat window or uh, when a refugee, what's to mind? What's the word that comes that pops into your mind when I say refugee? Please chat us in the box. A word, or it could be phrases. Maybe there's a visual image that comes to your mind. That has popped up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What else? Mm -hmm. Masses longing to be free, right? right. Just for, yeah, yeah. There are a lot of the words that pop into people's mouths. It means um, we found the most common one though uh, when we when we just when you really just play the word association game, refugee, and the next word that comes out is camp, right? That's really the word that pops to people's minds very often. It's the standing of you know that there's resettlement involved, that people are fleeing, right? That they're brave and scared. A lot of the things that folks are bringing up, right? Facing the challenges. Um, but this is imagery that's in people's heads, right? Refugee camp. And, you know, it's not inaccurate, right? I mean, this is definitely a refugee situation. This is what happens. Um, gosh, there's some things that would be better, right? And so talk about today, what would be a better association for people to have with um, the word refugee? And we're showing this photo because... Because, you know, who do these folks signal test? And, folks, if you want to share it with people, too, at the end of the chat bar, you might want to change your setting to all attendees. Um, if you want to share, if you want to say something privately to the attendees, you can do that. But you can, there's a toggle over there that you can say all attendees or all panelists or, or you chat directly to someone. But in a conversation, it might be nice to um, for folks to share with everybody, at least all panelists. Um, better, right? Courage, inspiring, right? Contributing, um, for be thinking resilient. Yeah, to be thinking about um, the way that refugees contribute, Americans, contributors to our workforce and tax base. Exactly. And we want to share with you the technology to do this in a um, in this session is very difficult. But uh, there's a group that we worked with out of Tennessee. Um, Turk is their acronym. Holly, what is the um, Tennessee um, right? Coalition. They um, made a video uh, actually in in terms of uh, trying to advance the immigration reform package that's been moving through Congress uh, this summer and fall. Um, but they made a video about, about 
a bunch of folks in the community, but there was one part of it that really spoke to us when we were thinking about this. And I'm not even going to link at you. We're not going to watch it today um, because the technology is too tough. But I really want to encourage you um, to, uh, to pick at this video at some point, particularly at the part where it starts at nine at about nine minutes and thirty seconds. And you'll see in there the story of some grants um, who did a cab company in Tennessee. And, uh, you know, it started very small with one cab, and then they added another cab. And at this point, they've got a fleet of cabs and a host of different uh, employees, a lot of immigrants, some native-born, um, and they're really contributing a service that the community needs in terms of transportation and in terms of liability, safety, and they're um, a fabric of the community now, and they are employers. They're creating jobs, right? They're creating service. They are delivering value. And it's a fantastic story of the kinds of things that immigrants and refugees do every day that are the things that we don't hear as often and which would really be much better um, for us to be telling and, and hearing. Um, one message to me that folks are using the Q&A section we're not seeing. So under your chat window, Amanda. I, I read off some of the things that are popping in, though, um, just in terms of association as they come up. So feel free to use either your chat or Q and A. Got it. Scanning my Q and A bar. Thank you. And I did chat the video as well as the um, time mark, Amanda, that you mentioned. And so folks aren't seeing that. Um, you know what we can repost it, and we'll be sure that it gets posted with the slides following the session on the Welcoming America website. Great, thank you. So that's just an example of the kinds of stories that we all know of that we have in our arsenal, but that we thought they did a great job in telling there, because we do know a lot about what works, right? We've, we've got lessons from the LGBT and marriage equality movement. Um, we've also got lessons from the immigration reform that's happening. Um, which really put to work here. So in preparation for the legislation, which does appear to be stalled in Congress at the moment, but um, in preparation for trying to uh, make, get, get that legislation moving and to build the base, right, because um, there's been a lot of work around messaging and immigration that was really designed to kind of uh, move the sort of the unmovable. Um, and the folks that you see represented in this slide, which involve, which are a combination of of um, education consultants and strategists um, who work together and do even better work around immigration messaging, um, they invested in a, a lot of research right, um, to try to figure out messages that uh, that really resonated with the base and with immigration leaders themselves, and also messages that moved movable folks and that alienated movable folks, right? This was this innovation in this world. A lot, a lot of times we do message testing and we try to think about the folks who are farthest away from us and how to move them. Um, but what we've learned uh, in opposition research a lot of times, unfortunately, is that our opposition does this better than I do, we do. And there's a group of people who are kind of in the middle on these issues but are willing to move to our side if they hear the right, issue, hear the right messages. Um, and this can often overlap well with messages that we're comfortable with as people who um, can immigrants and, and live this work and know um, and know this work and, and want to do things that far values um, and can alienate folks, the alienating, right? Folks who, who are anti-immigrant and who aren't moving. And so they did this research to figure out what frames worked. And what's great is that these frames can really be applied in the refugee space, and that's what we've tried to do um, to do with you. So the frame that they found um, that was really working for people, they, they called the frame Define America. And um, what we've done is take a little slice on this to kind of use in a refugee setting, but it's very, very close to the work that they've done um, and the messages that they found really resonated. I'm going to go ahead and read this to you. The, the frame is called Define America, and this is the messaging that they found worked. America is a nation of values founded on an idea. All men and women are created equal. All these truths to be self-evident, that all people have rights no matter what they look like or where they come from. How 
how we treat new refugees reflects our commitment to the values that define us as Americans. We believe families should stick together, that we should look out for each other, and that our work should be rewarded. You see, it's not just about what you look like or where you were born that makes you American. It's live your life and what you do that defines you here in this country. When these came here, they understand these American values. They are leaving countries where they face discrimination, threats, and even violence. Bringing your family here to build a better, safer life is a quintessentially American thing to do. Define American frame, and it really uh, asks you to define America in a way that is in keeping with our values and in keeping with, uh, just as the driver was saying earlier, the fact that we are a nation of immigrants and people who have come here to make their lives for ourselves. And Amanda, I just want to chime in on the values point. I see that Faith has posted a question sort of asking, you know, whose values? And I think um, to really underscore that what we want to, what we want to chime into are, um, it, 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 Amanda and I would almost call who could argue with that values, right? The idea that some ideas are just so core, um, the notion of making a better life for your family, the notion of um, hard work being a valuable thing to do, um, the notion that it's how you live your life that, that, that defines who you are in this country. We really want to, those kind of broadly held ideas about um, America are some of those values that we want to tap into and reclaim um, for newcomers in our communities, right? It, it just, it, you don't have to be born here to hold those values. Um, that, you know, the idea that we're created equal, that people have rights no matter where they look like or where they come from. Um, those are the kinds of values that we want to underscore um, and lean into because they're, they're, um, they're, they're held um, by many, and I see, Faith, that you're making a counterpoint um, to that. And so I want to honor that, and I totally recognize that, um, you know, part of what we're doing here is trying to bring values to um, folks who aren't necessarily already preceded of the same um, the same respect we hold for newcomers, and it's about trying to to bridge values and ideals that we hold with values and ideals that others might hold as well. So you know, it's true we're never going to find something that's perfect for everybody, but what we are sharing with you is really well researched messaging that has been. Um, uh, that, that was grown up from the grassroots space of folks who are advocating uh, with and on behalf of newcomer communities um, as messaging that they felt they could be comfortable with and that they felt could build a bridge, um, and not just felt but highly tested. Um, this is messaging that actually started in the community of immigrant, immigrant leaders um, and which we're now trying to um, share more broadly with advocates in the community because we feel like give message testing and the responses that we've seen, um, they can be highly effective. But you also raise a good point, which is this question of targets. So if you mm -hmm. reflect certain values, um, are the values that are folks that we need to move, right? And so part of the strategy here when you're thinking about reframing is is definitely the audience that you're trying to move and if, um, and select their values. And so, you know, depending on where we were taking this, uh, and the goals that you had for your reframing, you would want to test that, and you would want to make sure. And that's part of the reason why we're bringing this to you, because there has been, a, you know, we can benefit from this investment that was made in testing out these messages um, and finding out where they worked. But we also want to. It's a discussion starting point too, because we want to get your feedback on them. And so, you know, I'm right. We'd love to see, and you can chat this, or you can send this to us later. You know, uh, show it. Can you point us in the direction of another value system that we should look at? Um, or, you know, other values and ideals that we can tap into as we're thinking about messaging that will resonate. Good. So and feel free to open that um, invitation for feedback to all who are on the, uh, who are on the call. Um, you know, as Amanda said, we really are hoping to make these work and be adaptable and be useful to those of you doing work in in your own communities. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. So part of what we want to do is get your reaction. It's really helpful. I will go ahead and um, share with you the next set of messages in the um, the suite that was researched. And Amanda, I'll ask you to click the slide forward because I don't have um, oh, yeah. I don't have the power. You're powerful. Um, next sort of set of messaging. Um, that was found to resonate both at the grassroots with newcomer communities and with 
um, the, the, the yet persuaded, shall we say, is a set of messages around the dignity of work. Um, and this is so fundamental to the American story that even sort of quintessentially American companies like Levi's will tell this story um, as a way to, to fit into that narrative. Um, so I'll go ahead and read to you the messages that, um, that fell under this dignity of work frame. Out of many cultures, our country's strength is grounded in our ability to work together as fellow Americans. For those who cook the food that we eat, to those who create innovative new businesses, new immigrants and refugees realize the value of working hard and doing your part in exchange for the blessings of liberty. As Americans, we all do our part to contribute, and we're all the better for having hardworking new refugees as contributing members of our communities by being customers in our stores, paying payroll taxes, and giving to churches and charities. All Americans living here come from diverse backgrounds and many different places. We are united by deep respect for those who work hard for a living and a shared commitment to the country we all call home. America works best when we all do our part and work together as one nation, indivisible and strong. Thanks, Holly. Yeah, yeah, and I'm seeing some, some actions. I love the word gumption. Um, <laughs> that that's coming up, right? The notion that the courage it takes to um, to come as a refugee or an immigrant to this country, and I, I'm also seeing a really great um, question um, from Kelly about the importance of distinguish, distinguishing, excuse me, distinguishing between refugees and immigrants in these narratives. Um, you know, how important is that that uh, distinction? And I think the answer is maybe not very much. Um, Amanda will share a message next that that to underscore that I think you know you're hearing us use language like newcomers um, and that actually that phrase is which works in both the instances of refugees and or immigrants actually helps to underscore this next frame that Amanda will share yes. I also want to let you know I've been trying someone asked if they were going to if we're going to send you the frames and I I chatted the link to the full research for some reason I can't and Hannah I don't know if you can help me with this but I'm unable to answer the questions in the Q&A Okay. Um, so if um, if you want to research, uh, uh, you can yeah. So I, I, people are requesting the messages. And the answer is absolutely. I chatted the the immigrant version of them, which is quite close, is at the link that I set in the chat window. And then also these will be um, with with your feedback. These will form um, the backbone of some of what we put together in the messaging toolkit. So there is yes and yes. Um, and I will, as soon as I get the technology to work to get it to folks in the Q&A, I will. But um, you can all look um, for these in the chat window. And Hannah, um, so the next, they're being sent directly to all the panelists as well. Oh, great, 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 great. So the final frame uh, that we want to share with you that um, came out of this testing is called People Move. And I will read it to you now. The same is true today as it has been. And somebody even previewed this, I'm sorry, in, in a comment they made earlier. And so I it's, I think it's great to show how these folks, how these are all resonating with people. Uh, the same is true today as it has been throughout history. People move to make life better for themselves and their families. It's hard to move. To pack up everything and go to a new place takes courage. But you do it in order to put food on the table, to buy for your family, or to send your kids to a decent school. Refugee Americans move here for the promise of freedom and opportunity in this country, and often to escape persecution and violence in order to improve life, and we believe that moving to make a better life for your family is one of the best things and one of the hardest things a person can do. One of the values we hold to our hearts is a deeply rooted belief in the freedom to be who you want to be, say what you want to say, and go where you want to go. America is supposed to be the land of the free and the home of the brave. That's a good thing, so let's keep it that way. And one of the I think this particular frame is so powerful is that um, – Many folks have the experience of moving, right? They have the experience of making a frightening decision to, to really change their circumstances, per, perhaps not as radically as some of the newcomers in our community. But it's a way of talking about that experience um, in a way that invites other people to connect to it and invites other people to um, connect to in their lives where maybe they had to make a big decision to change their circumstances in order to do something better for their families. So it's a way of, again, building a bridge between ideas and experiences that those we're working with and on behalf of have as part of their story to other stories that the folks we want to connect with might also have as part of their experience. Yeah. But also it is slightly different because, um, you know, something that we use a lot, and this is true, I mean, I'm 
second question, and, and I hear that we're a nation of immigrants and that all of us, um, somebody chatted to the panel, most of us would be today if some of our ancestors didn't have the gumption to leave their homelands, either as refugees or immigrants. And, and that's so true. The immigrant experience, unless you, know, unless you are a, a first people of nation or a native person, the experience is part of almost every na- American's experience. Um, and yet, messaging, the, the nation of immigrants messaging, the testing of it, has gone well lately. People have disconnected from that, or it's a phrase that's kind of lost meaning. And what we love about this people move frame is that it, it, it's the same thing in a lot of ways, but it says it in a, in a much more current way that people connect with. Um, so I did chat, chat in, too, that refugees have no choice, and that's true, right? Most of the time, most of us have some say in our next move, choose where to move, um, you know, most of the time. And there's definitely uh, that, and that's that's why we want to filter these messages and hear sort of how they do differ from the refugee experience. But that being said, you know, once you're in this new place, you're making the best of it. And that's you for yourselves and your family. And it's hard and it's scary. And that's true for all of us, whether you've moved, you know, from Des Moines to Topeka or from, you know, Syria to the United States. That kind of resiliency and that kind of commitment to making life better for your family is something that resonates with people and people can understand. Thoughts on these frames um, before we dig into trying to get some more uh, content out of you. <laughs> We've just given a bunch of content to you. Now we're going to try to get some content out of you. So we're happy to, to uh, remind you of these. You will get the text um, and the full research here. But these are the three frames that are really this define America. What does it really mean to be American? And how much of what we consider American values are shared by folks who've come here um, as immigrants or refugees? The dignity of work and the fact that that um, is such a deeply held value in our community um, and the contribution that we all have to make and how valuable each of our contributions is. And finally, this people move question um, and issue, the fact that of trying to connect the idea of moving to make a better life and, and universalizing that and seeing that that's something that immigrants do, it's something that refugees do, and it's something that People sometimes move across town or move across state or whatever, that this idea of taking the risk um, for the reward of making a better life. Um, what you'll see in the research is that there's a lot of specific language choices. Um, New Americans, uh, we had a, a, a group who was like, well, I don't know about New Americans, but they said New Heart Heels. They were coming out of North Carolina. They love that idea. So there's some language in there, some really specific language in there that you can play with to try to find um, words that are both descriptive and refreshing and uh, have moved people who are other times sort of more, um, it's close to language that tends to separate people. And Mary, I want to um, uh, address the question you just chatted to the panelists. Uh, Mary's comment was that the first two, the titles of the frames seem a little, uh, excuse me, the, the, the last two titles of the frames, Divine America, uh, I'm sorry, I'm totally messing this up. The last two frames, people move and the dignity of work, um, seem really self-explanatory, whereas the, the notion of define America um, maybe seems a little bit counterintuitive. Um, but really, it, it is almost a, um, it, it's almost a call to reclaim the definition of what of, of American values, right? right? To reclaim the notion of hard work. So. Um, and, and the notion of freedom and, and belief in equality. So, um, point take that the um, that uh, that the maybe the framing isn't quite as clear, and we'll, we'll think about that as we present the messages. Yeah, the, to the that's, that's really helpful. Well, yeah, because I think that you're right. Dignity work of work and people move are much more self-explanatory. But define America is a little bit more heightened, if you will. That's helpful feedback. Um, so if you hear use them or local examples. And um, I would love for folks to share with us, and actually we'll we'll get into that more, but, um, you know, we agree and and that that's really what you need in order to make this work. And that's why we do want you to look at that video. The video is a really good example of um, a dig of work story being told in a local setting. Um, And some other folks, um, a story to share too that we we can keep going. But if folks have story hours, or so that they can think of in their kind of in their file cabinet of things that they talk about with with their clients or their communities. Um, we'd love to hear them that might fit this frame. Um, 
I mean, there is a, 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 a concern here that this framing uh, is is intended to kind of mainstream refugees and, and make them sort of acceptable, and that in some ways some of these messages could reinforce things that make it difficult for refugees. Um, I'm curious to hear more about that if people think that are um, – that would reinforce difficulties for folks. Uh, I somebody respond to that question with the notion around we are America. Um, and I think you know that idea is exactly you know sort of that more inclusive title um, is exactly about what we're trying to do, right? It is to essentially claim the sense of belonging. Um, and claim the notion of America is broader that um, than maybe some folks think of it. So the reactions and the the recommendations we're hearing from you is really really helpful. So move into getting um, some messaging out of people <laughs> after we've shared this messaging with you. Um, I would love folks to finish this sentence. Refugees are an important part of our community because. And you can go to either the chat window or the Q&A and we'll be tracking both. We yeah. talents they bring, cultural color to our community. They bring unique experience. It's coming fast and furious. <laughs> they enrich our communities with their cultures and ideas. And you know, it's a challenge to separate refugees from immigrants. Uh, is that refugees are a small fraction of immigrants. Um, yeah, I think this is an interesting question, as, as Holly was saying, that I actually think less separation might be to the benefit um, because the refugee framing as, as uh, or a community that comes Shattered and in need, um, and this on the possibilities that they faced, as opposed to the possibilities that they bring. America, American. I love that because, um, mm -hmm. and so that's something that could be framed a different way, right? But I think that that's so true. They are community. appreciation and understanding of American values. That is great. The very fresh way of looking at things, fresh ways of solving problems. The great. It's all these, but there's so there's so many, but they're great. great. In unity, and there's a lot of themes in here, right? Um, that's fantastic. Opportunities can contribute to overall community health. Now this would be a little bit harder. This next, next one. Remind. This is, Um, I want you to start getting specific. So folks ask for, for let's hear about them in a, in, a, in a local setting. And actually, we're going to put that back to you. Uh, tell us these two stories from a local setting. So we would love to see this sentence filled in. Blame of refugee or that refugee community has or a family committed to our community by and is a contribution. So the, um, when you have a chance to watch the video we showed you, we could say the name of the taxi company has contributed to our community by providing safe and reliable transportation for anyone who needs it. Hey, somebody shared with us an Einstein quote. A bunch of belongings isn't the only thing a refugee brings to this country. And that his new country. specific stories roll in, too. Mary George, a South Sudanese refugee, has contributed to our community by teaching those working in school about how to work with the Sudanese population. Mm. Uh, another, Jean Golo, has contributed to our community by starting a successful farm, employing Americans, and providing healthy produce to food desert areas. Oh, great story. Um, Ahmed has contributed go ahead, to our sorry. community by continuing his medical training at our local hospital. Hospital now been accepted to a medical residency program. 
Refugees contributed to our community by starting many restaurants and stores. They're buying homes and cars, making our existing communities more economically stable. And here's a really powerful one. My wife has contributed to our community by volunteering to serve, help, and assist. She's become a role model to our, our kids. And what is so powerful about taking, taking it out of the general and into the specifics is that you can't argue with sort of those data points of experience, right? And, and when we weave together any number of specific stories, as you've just helped us do by sharing them, um, that's to um, sort of make a mosaic of all these stories, of all these um, of all these experiences that people can connect to on an individual and human level in our communities. It's an interesting question, which I think is really worth addressing, right? So why do you all have to bring something? You know, aren't people just worthy because they are people? And, you know, we can't ignore. People are worthy just because they're people. And, you know, that is, that, there's no question that that is, uh, we all have an inherent value and that we don't have, to contribute. But don't forget the name of this session, right? It's reframing. And the challenge is that, yes, people are worthy of our respect and our love and our caring just by sure of being people. But the challenge is that the current notion of what refugees are is this understanding of neediness, of brokenness, of a drain in our community. And so we really just want to remind people that that's not the whole story. This isn't about making people worthy or not worthy by their contribution, contributions, but it's about reminding folks that what the story they are hearing is not the whole story. There's more going on than that. And I think it also helps us um, make personal connections. There's, a, there's one that was shared here by uh, Pam Livingston, which I really love. De Leon's restaurant has contributed to our community by providing my husband, along with many others, his favorite drive through right? That, 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 these, that folks are coming to our communities are actually making some of our favorite experiences and some of our favorite features in our communities. So it's not just about um, this abstract notion of, you know, I, I don't know any refugees or I don't have any experience with any refugees. It's about helping people make a personal connection. Thanks. You're fantastic. Garden in Tampa Bay area is bringing organic food to our community and providing jobs to newcomers and healthy food to all of us. Love this one. Mohammed has helped our community with civic engagement yeah. to fight an oil pipeline in our state. And that's powerful, right? Because that's an issue that you're going to be able to bridge common concern. I'm sure a number of people are concerned about how that might health, uh, might affect their health or their environment. And so by, by, again, demonstrating common concern for our family and for the places where we live, it's a great way to build those bridges. A lot of interesting conversation that's sort of a sidebar here about this sort of, um, you know, how, how helpful is it and how useful is it to distinguish between immigrants and refugees? Um, one person has brought up that uh, refugees have uh, get certain support that other folks don't um, as a result of the fact that they're, um, you know, that they're seeking asylum or uh, under, in a situation where um, they need additional support. Uh, that is a problem. We wouldn't want to, we wouldn't want to discourage that. And there's some concern that that maybe that line between refugees and immigrants center um, could do. Although somebody else makes the point, well, long do we call refugees refugees? At what point are they then immigrants or Americans, <laughs> whatever it is? Um, you know, because there's also there, is there a time limit to that? Um, so that's a really interesting question. Um, and I would love to hear how people navigate that in their community or how important they think it is. I think is interesting. I'm seeing um, some already pick up the language of new Americans. So when asked this question about sort of, you know, uh, this fill in the blank question that's on the screen right now, uh, Beverly Keem Kime, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm mispronouncing your name, Beverly said, new Americans have contributed to our community by voting. I wish more longstanding Americans made a habit of doing so, right? So um, the notion of, you know, how, where you go on the um, uh, on the stream, or, or you know, how long do you hold on to a label? And I think that's really important, right? The notion that that labels and identities are fluid, um, as 
people have new experience and experiences and as people bring um, their talents and um, their experiences to bear. And so, you know, obviously you want to check in with the communities you're serving to, to, to understand how folks want to be, uh, they want to show up. Um, but there's also, I just think, some interesting ways that, that that can be fluid, right, from refugee to new American. So just wanted to point that out. I think it's up to the refugee, which is a great point, right? Self-determination is really critical in these. And, and you know, as we, as we do talk about people telling people's stories, it's, it's critical that um, it, it, stories are the most powerful way we can connect people to one another. Um, on the one the other hand, you know, a person's story is their own to, is their own to tell, and we um, don't ever want to undermine um, people's privacy or their desire to tell their story in their own way. And so, um, yeah, I really want to respect that and thank somebody for that comment. I am thinking we should move to the third question, Amanda, so we still have some time for Q&A. Absolutely. Then, uh, Director Nagash is also staying on the line to be available for the Q&A section as well. Um, so we will um, ask you one final question here. Is a little bit of a shift, and this might be more about your work, but we really want to hear about the solutions. What's working out there? What's making life better for refugees and the communities that they're enriching? Um, so you know, one thing our community has done to welcome refugees is And one of the reasons we want to sort of hear some of these stories is because in addition to sort of shining a light on the individual experiences of um, contributions of refugees, we also want to catch our neighbors and our welcoming communities in the act of doing things right. right? We want to elevate those stories because often people, are, you know, we are by good people of goodwill who sometimes just don't know what to do. Um, and so the more we can point to effective solutions that are working and elevate those, um, the more we can model the kinds of things that we would like to see happen uh, in more and more communities. So if someone shared the example, Emily Vitale shared the example of organizing a Hello Neighbor event at the Mohammed Ali Center to let long-term residents get to know their new neighbors. Another thing um, that Florence Ackie's community has done is to organize an international festival when refugees um, join together for a local cultural festival and fashion show. Oh, well. uh, Marcy Mraz's um, community, they've established a weekly refugee help center at a local apartment complex in an area where many refugees live. In a session where refugees can get answers to questions, help with filing forms, or making telephone calls. She says that one thing that um, her community has done to welcome refugees is that one of the local churches offered to serve as a site for ESL classes once they felt that their location um, didn't have child care or enough space for all the students who wanted to take the classes. Here's a little story in Atlanta on Martin Luther King Jr. Day of service. Um, hundreds of people gathered to pack rice, books, pots into refugees, and read to refugee children. And that's a nice really knitting together of um, different cultural celebrations, right, and, and honoring, um, you know, a, a person whose life was a, about service and change and commitment, uh, love, and, and sharing that love with, with newcomers. Bill talks about how um, members of her community have actually set up apartments for newcomers and in doing so have really tried to take into consideration all the small details that a family will need, right down to the stuffed monkey left in a rocking chair for the child that was going to be living in that apartment. And, you know, we, we can't, that, those kinds of details really bring things to life. Thank you so much for sharing that. The more that you, you know, tell the story in, in those kinds of ways, um, the more that folks feel. That's a really wonderful little detail. And like um, this one that was shared by Leah Elbert, that one of the things that her community has done is to um, have what they call a tapestry project that weaves together relationships between refugees, police officers, community members, and others to learn how to navigate it and work well together. Martha sharing. Um, a uh, great way of really um, link recognition and celebration 
um, she talked about how in January that with the help of some churches, um, organize an annual um, January 1st birthday party since many refugees come with unknown birth dates. Um, and that that's a party that celebrates all refugees with prizes for kids and adults. And again, really um, shines light on sort of a specific challenge um, that many in the refugee community have. Also, some of these examples show that, that what this research has taught us about language is stuff that you um, get intuitively by being among the community. You know, seeing that so many of your events are called Hello Neighbor or Welcome Your Neighbor, mm -hmm. Love Your Neighbor campaign. You know, they all show that um, the frame here really isn't about us and them. The frame is about us. It's us. We're all neighbors. We're all in the community. Um, this is a new Citizens Academy, right? So it's not about who you were, but about who you are um, now, and I, we really just—it's uh, really just great to see this that, um, that that you already get a lot of this by being in your community and working with folks. It's actually to you to, to be inclusive, and that's fantastic because that's not only the right thing to do, but it's it's the winning thing to do is what our research has shown, or the re not our but the research that we have reviewed has shown. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, I um, encourage folks to keep the ideas and examples coming. Um, many of the ideas that you're sharing, I think, are, are um, not only useful for Amanda and I as we think about messaging and, and, and think about the, the ways you're expressing these ideas, but they also will be captured and shared, um, as several folks have requested, so that you can learn from each other's ideas and questions and comments as well. Um, and some of you, who knows, maybe you'll get ideas for events and other things you can be doing on the ground, because there's some really wonderful, wonderful examples in here. Um, Amanda, do you want to move us forward? Yeah, so, you know, this is, this is our, uh, you know, we just want to open it up a little bit to questions and comments. Um, so we've been bringing up ideas throughout the session, which we really appreciate. Um, you know, again, this question of sort of, you know, refugee versus immigrant language and that kind of stuff. We'd also like to know, you know, we are working on taking some of these ideas and putting together a messaging toolkit for you that reflects uh, the latest research and thinking and our uh, work in this space. And we just want to know what your needs are. You know, what do you really, what do you feel lacking when you go into the community? What a messaging tool could help you with? Um, we would, you know, we really, we live to be useful, uh, Holly and I. We really, really what we want to provide is, is, is what we can use and that you can, we value what you do in the communities and we want it to keep getting better. So share with us, uh, we need to know more about what you need to see more of. Uh, we can make sure that we deliver something that is, that is great, that is useful to put to work. And if there are specific challenges you're running into in your communities, um, specific questions that keep coming up again and again, um, then those are the kinds of things we want to know about so we can hopefully develop some tools to help address them. And we're getting some great questions that are already popping up, right? How to engage community officials in the conversation? What are activities to reach out to? Um, public systems leaders, what, what kinds of promotional materials should we be creating? Um, funding ideas is the ever-present question for all of us in the nonprofit sector. Um, and we're, I'm getting another um, great question. It looks like, oops, it just uh, went somewhere. It just went uh, from Bruce Work, uh, Bryce Workman, excuse me, who's saying, um, these are great ideas, but definitely curious about platforms and avenues for message promotion and is interested in social media success stories. Um, and again, uh, one of the things, I'll just point to, um, Amanda mentioned this in North Carolina, um, but we were really impressed by um, some work that our colleagues there in North Carolina were doing as they were, um, again, sort of test out this messaging and think about what are some things in the community that, you know, folks can connect to. And rather than use the language around new Americans or aspiring Americans, um, they picked up on an even more local flavor, right? And they picked up actually on college football, and they talked about aspiring Tar Heels. Um, and they, uh, there's a whole way of sort of picking up on that notion and, and engaging in storytelling around that, right? Like think about kids at a tailgate party who are wearing the, you know, the oversized jerseys and the photos and how you know, tweet-worthy and Instagram-worthy those kinds of things can be. And so I would say think about ways to take some of the stories that you've shared with us and put them in a microcosm, right? How can you visually tell the story of that Martin Luther King Day of Service? How can you visually tell the story of Dion's being, you know, everyone's favorite drive 
through. I think really finding ways to do mini storytelling can be incredibly powerful um, across some of these platforms. So those just a quick brainstorm from me. Yeah, I'm hearing some of this notion that about getting making sure that we strike a balance, right? That when we talk about how successful refugees are, um, you know, that we do have to remind folks that that doesn't mean that there isn't still support needed um, or uh, you know need to do work as a community to make sure that we do what we can as a community to help people be successful. So that's really um, valuable feedback, and and we will definitely try to keep that balance in mind. And I'm seeing dialogue um, in the Q&A as well about the power of community reads, right, and choosing um, a book. I know many cities um, do, you know, mm. so we call it a one city, one book program. Um, can you influence the selection of the book that's chosen? It sounds like um, I'm Your Neighbor Portland is doing a series of events like that. And um, the, their, their website is I'mYourNeighborPortland.org. So folks can take a look at what they're doing as well. And um, from the director, but I would love to um, actually just put him if he, if he wants to add some comments to this, um, me reading his words. But that's not possible, then I'm happy to read. <laughs> If Director Nagash is still on the line, we'd love to um, invite you to respond to some of the questions that are popping up and um, respond with some of your own thoughts and remarks as well. Everyone, Hannah, do you know if we still have the director on the line? Yes, I'm on the line. Oh, great. How to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at it. Uh, so what's the question? I remember hearing the question. Well, you you shared some comments earlier, and I, I was, I'd was i be happy to read them, but I was just going to say if you want to. Go ahead. Um, I just felt, you know, this is something I, I have it in my office. Uh, uh, I, I, I thought, you know, people will benefit. Uh, you know, it, it has been uh, something I have been sharing with people. I say, you know, you know, we are a messenger in the community, but I think we need also to do some self-reflection self of about our own challenges. And I think that's how the system works, the relationship works when we have when we bring the two together rather than just simply looking at it from, from the outside. So feel free to read it. I, I, I thought it, was, it would help in our discussion. Um, okay, I just need to scroll back to it. Or Holly, you have it handy? Um, also scrolling, scrolling, scrolling to find it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here we go. I've got it. I, okay. It's, I, it's bilingual and bicultural. Um, and I, is there a genesis for, for the, I mean, is this tweeted to somebody or is this just? Unknown. Uh, <laughs> as unknown, okay. Bilingualism, <laughs> as so many of our great works are, um, bilingualism itself is not enough. Until we become self-reflective about the strengths and limits of our own culture, we won't be able to become effective ministers in another culture, no matter how many languages we speak. Very few of us can expect to become bicultural as well as bilingual, but we aspire to the co-humility, which, which enables us to understand the limitations of our own culture and the positive elements of someone else's. That's great. Thanks. Thanks for reading it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a really powerful um, state, and I think it, uh, you know, how much of the work that we've seen folks do reflects that, um, but that it's also the standard that we can all be aspiring towards. I think our work requires that. You know, I think we can only do this work if we have that self-reflective -re -re and having the humility to understand and 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 consider each other as brothers and sisters. Um, otherwise, you know, I I always struggle the idea that somebody is a giver and another person is a, a receiver. I think if you ask refugees, they will tell you, you know, especially refugees coming from the camp, 
the thing they want is not you know somebody trying to give them something. It's somebody to consider them they are capable enough to make a, a wise decision for them and for their family. So that that relationship, I I, I remember uh, a resettlement agency uh, director told me one time that he is very busy, and so he comes into the office all the time every morning, you know, try to make sure that somebody is getting to the job interview or somebody is going to the social services office. For whatever reason, one day he stopped, uh, you know, in, in his office, before he get to his office in the, the waiting room and say, is there anything I can do for you guys? And everybody apparently knew he was a director. And the refugee said, yeah, for you to say hi to us. Mm-hmm. And expecting that, you know, I were waiting for somebody, you know, they just simply say, just if you say to us, that's it, you know, that's that's good enough. So sometimes, you know, we're so busy, we want to do so many things with so little resources, but we forget that human contact, you know. Refugees, so they've been getting, you know, uh, you know, whatever small amount of handout in a refugee camp for 10, 15, 20 years. But the idea that this is the first time now they can make independent, free decision as to what this country gives them. They is not really refugee cash assistant or housing or anything. Freedom. Now, for the first time in their life, they have freedom to choose where to go, what to do. They just want somebody to help them, you know, achieve their dream. So that that's really something we need always to take into consideration. I think another thing we can do to help refugees is using former refugees to be partners with us, because they can share. They 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 know how 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 to how to make it here. They should be our partners. I mean, in fact, part of integration is being civically engaged in our community. Uh, and, and part of that engagement is helping, you know, commerce, you know, and uh, as a former refugees, you know, we can we can host them for one day in our house. You know, we can invite them to our, you know, uh, you know synagogue or churches or mosque. Uh, so there's a lot of things we can do, but I think we need to bring in former refugees and refugees who have been in this country 10, 15, 20 years, uh, and, and back to back this project of welcoming Americans. Uh, the refugees are American in waiting. Uh, most of them within five years, they are naturalized U.S. citizen. They, you know, that's going to be the first time they chose what citizen they uh, they, they wanted to be. So, so there's a lot of joy and there's a lot of uh, you know, satisfaction and, and the work we do. And I happen to believe most of you uh, are doing it because this is this uh, this is a meaningful work, you know. And, and I think our life is always enriched when, when we spend, when, when we dedicate our life to make a difference on another people. So that that's the way I see it. Uh, for me, that has been a, a guiding principle as, you know, I, I, I know the journey and I, I was one of them. Uh, and and whatever I can do, uh, I'm going to dedicate my life in serving them. And through that service, I guide my, myself and, and uh, the reason to live. You know, um, you know, one of our uh, one of our participants has asked to Director Nagash, uh, can you expand on the idea of how to encourage that cultural humility, what it looks like, how we know when we've achieved it? I, know, I, I don't know. You can uh, measure it and achieve it. I think it's it's within you. You know. I mean, I mean, I can't tell you. You know. I mean, you know. I, I work here in Washington. You know, cultural humility is not one thing that you learn around here. <laughs> uh, and, and humility in general is not here. It's, this is a place where you can do self motion. Uh, but I I think. I think you will know that humility when when you see it. You know, I I think I, you know, I told people uh, a story uh, I heard from uh, a Hasidin Jew. Uh, had a Hasidin rabbi ask his student one time, and he asked them, "Can you tell me the difference? Uh, what you know, darkness and light? You know, how how do you distinguish that?" His students, you know, gave him all kind of answers. Oh, if you see a fig tree, you know, you, you know it's daytime. If you see a car coming from a distance, they gave him all kind of practical answers. And finally he keeps saying, no, no. So they got tired of that answer and say, Rabbi, give us the answer. You know, what, how do you distinguish from day, uh, daylight and nighttime? It's very easy, he said. When you see a person, 
you know, regardless of who they are, if you see yourself, that's daytime. And you don't see yourself through that person, that's darkness. Mm. So I think it is like that, you know. Uh, and that's the way I happen to believe. So I, I don't know how to tell you, but humility requires that 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 you always do self-examination of your own contribution, um, whether it's uh, with the client or with your colleagues. You know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it's a lifelong commitment, you know, in, and I don't know when we get to the point says, yes, I have really achieved that humility, but I think it's a day-to-day thing, how we work, how we carry ourselves, uh, how we talk about other people. Uh, it's, it's a, you know, an ongoing, you know, and will struggle, I guess. Yeah. Well, that's a gorgeous place to end. And what a wonderful story. And uh, thank you so much for sharing. I want to, you know, Holly and I want to thank you for um, inviting us to be a part of this and entering, um, but also how much we have left to learn. And thank you so much, everyone, for your for your comments and your feedback and your thoughts. And um, we're going to show them. I know folks uh, couldn't see what other people were saying. That's the nature of the system. But um, has assured us that she'll make sure folks get each other's comments. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I just want to – Oh, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Can I say something before you hang up? Please. I was going to hand it back to Rachel, but um, but yes. So I just I just want to say you know on behalf of ORR uh, and uh, and if on behalf of refugees uh, and perhaps coming, this perhaps is the most inspiring, very encouraging discussion uh, I remember in the past 30 years. And I just wanted to uh, thank you, uh, welcoming America, and all of you. Uh, and I, I I see a number of people that I have known for many years also listening. This is really quite exciting. I think when I, when I put that uh, sixth principle, I say a client-centered decision-making process is one of them. Uh, and this is what I meant, that client-centered decision-making. For us to make a client-centered decision-making, we need to talk about the client all the time. But we need to talk to them, uh, talk about them in a very positive, in a very inspiring way, rather than, you know, in a focusing on, on the deficit they may have, which I do not, you know, I don't believe, you know, if a human being has any deficit. Uh, if there is a deficit, all of us has one of them. So I just, I really, you know, would say this from my heart, you know, thank you very much uh, talking in, in a way that's inspiring. Uh, and so I I think, you know, uh, again, you know, I, I, I guess since you are all our grantee, you know, I'm not allowed to say that, but I'm going to say that I think welcoming America I think you're you're doing a great job at least reminding us who we are as 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 workers with the refugee work, but at the same time as an American. You know, this is our story. This is a story of America. It's our grandparents' story. Uh, whether we were Irish when they came in Boston and whatever uh, insult they may have heard, this is this is just who we are as an American. And I think uh, what you are doing is reminding us our history, our road, and, and perhaps what makes us different. So that, that I really, really thank you very much. Thank uh, Nagash for ending uh, a very deep note. Um, and I think for us at Welcome America, this, this is me that we are all on very much together. I think that the participation on the call today was a reflection of the incredible work that people are doing in communities across the country and uh, a collection of the fact that people are really deeply committed to So I am so very excited about what uh, possibilities lie ahead, and I, I really want to thank you again and thank our speakers, Ali uh, Minch and Amanda Cooper. Uh, I am really looking forward to uh, the tools that come out of this conversation. Um, as they mentioned, um, we'll be uh, in touch with everybody to share the feedback that came from this call. Uh, but I also want to let you all know that we have a new website up, uh, something to celebrate, uh, which is coming refugees website um, where the materials from today will be posted and where we will continue uh, to feature all of the great work that's happening in the field, including York, if you're so inclined to share it with us. Uh, there's a section of the website called Share Your Story, and I really want to encourage everyone to share 
just practices that you shared with us uh, on the call today. It's really important that we continue this process of learning together. Um, so with that, um, I just want to remind everyone um, that after this call, we're going to be sending out a survey. And we would really appreciate if you could share uh, your feedback with us. We want to continue to make these calls uh, dynamic and interesting and really want to listen to your suggestions on how we can continue to, uh, to build and improve. Thank you all so much again for being on this call today. You all made it a great call. Um, thank you again, uh, Director Nagash. Thank you, Holly and Amanda. Uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation uh, about how we can uh, reach refugees in a way that is uh, positive and empowering. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks very much.